Okay. Well, so what do you got to tell us a little bit about uh, Richard? First, congratulations on your book and documentary. And uh, how about we start with a brief history of Richard's military career, as well as the obstacles he had to overcome due to his four foot nine inch frame? Well, the, uh, <clears throat> the military height and size requirements uh, are five feet tall and 100 pounds, and Richard at four foot nine and 97 pounds didn't qualify. So it took him actually three years of letter writing to get a congressional waiver to allow him to join the Army. Uh, once he was in the Army, he served with the 101st Airborne. When he got back to the States after his first tour, he uh, went to Special Forces School and then was um, sent to Thailand with the 46th Special Forces Group. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the third, the third Special Forces Group 46 company in Thailand. Wow, that's a that's a lot of dedication I, that young man in his, in his heart and mind at that time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, uh, you know, the 101st is, is really special because as I was working on this project and we can get into the nuts and bolts of it, man, I had so much assistance from, from the men of the 101st and I'm a stranger in that world. Uh, I never served in the military. I was a police officer for 20 years, but they really uh, helped me out and embraced me and, and, and helped me uh, learn a lot more about my friend and what they went through in Vietnam. That's the uh, crew. Oh, yeah, man. See my hat? Yeah. There you go, brother. I, thank you very much for the compliments. But yeah, they in and out, uh, in the service, out of the service, good, 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 great bunch of guys with the 101. Okay, so... Tell us what made you write the book. So uh, we're gonna have to go back. Uh, 1999, I transferred from another police department to uh, the city of Aventura, which is in North Miami Beach, Florida. And that's where I saw, um, first saw Richard Flaherty. I used to see him at the movie theater. Uh, at the time, just see the guy show up every, probably pretty much every day. It was a off duty job for me as a police officer to work for extra money in front of the movie theater. So we would start to say hello, and then uh, later I would see him out in the streets, and that's when I kind of realized that he was homeless. Um, now, homeless in the sense that, uh, you know, he, he didn't have a home, but he was clean, he was well-groomed, uh, took care of himself, uh, he was in good health, as far as I can tell. Um, you know, as a police officer, we try to get people assistance, but Richard was a very proud guy, and... Um, I could tell he just didn't want me prying into his business. And, you know, we kept it kind of light and we started a friendship and we were friends for about 15 years. A um, couple of times I tried to get him into, you know, a shelter or something. Um, but he, he, he was, uh, he's pretty adamant that he was fine. In uh, summer of 2015, you know, I never, like I said, I never really pressed Richard about his life. Uh, we were sitting down. We used to go for coffee and sandwiches. And he said, Dave, it's time I, I'll tell you about my life and uh, what I've done. And, and that's when he revealed this whole incredible saga to me. Now, um, one thing Richard didn't want me looking into, he was, he was adamant about, is that in the 80s, 1980, he worked with uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms in an undercover capacity to expose a uh, theft ring from Fort Bragg. So he said, look, you know, uh, I'll tell you everything, but I don't want you looking into that part of my life. And I thought it was kind of a little strange. And he said, uh, it could be bad for your career and a little dangerous for my health. Uh, I used to be a former detective. So it's, you know, once you tell me something like that, I'm going to look into it. I tracked down the, the agent he worked with, uh, Richard worked with, who was retired at the time. And he confirmed everything that Richard told me was true about the case. Six hours later, Richard gets killed in the middle of the night in, in a strange hit and run. Um, so it kind of just uh, forced me to, to go on this uh, journey of, of learning about my friend and uh, trying to honor his life. That's uh, co so complimentary. It's unbelievable. And what did you, where'd you start? So, uh, you know, we, we he was a, uh, born in Stanford, Connecticut. So I went up there, I flew up there and I, I met with family and friends. And I, I learned that, you know, he was born with, uh, his mom had a, a rare blood disease. Uh, I'm not gonna get too much into the medical, something about RH um, positive. And then he, he, it caused 
his um, pituitary glands to stop working. So he, he was medically diagnosed with dwarfism even as a child. So before he took his first breath, they knew he, he was going to be a dwarf. They didn't think he was going to grow to the height of four foot nine. They thought he was actually only going to get to like four foot five or four foot seven. But Richard outdid them and, and <laughs> he grew up to uh, four foot nine. Um, like I said, he fought his way into the military. Um, supposedly, uh, you know, uh, very well respected amongst all the men. Uh, he, in that first tour, he, he was uh, awarded the silver star, two bronze stars, and two purple hearts. And I do wow. know that he, he was injured uh, more times than the two times. Uh, right. And then, then he went back and, you know, he, he, he wanted to even take it further. And, and uh, that's when he got his Green Beret and the, he rose to the rank of captain. Um, Richard was caught, uh, like a lot of the guys, in 1971 in the uh, the RIF, the reduction in force, where the Army was downsizing. So he was let go or his contract wasn't renewed as an officer. And that was a, a little bit of a tough pill for Richard to swallow. He always wanted to stay in training and, and help out and teach lessons of what he learned in Vietnam. So... Um, we know that you know his trail gets a little murky, but he, he was in uh, South Africa working, doing mercenary work or private military contract work. Uh, there was actually a bunch of uh, Americans that went over there. I, I later learned that they called themselves the Crippled Eagles. Those were guys who were uh, riffed out of the military that still wanted to fight communism. And a lot of them went to, to Africa, to Rhodesia, to what they felt continue the fight against the Chinese and the Russians. And even uh, we know that some of the Cubans were over there training. Um, yeah. yeah. After after uh, after that, he um, actually went back into the military as a reserve captain, and that's when he got caught up in that undercover case. Why he became homeless? Uh, it's, it's really just a lot of factors. Uh, obviously, there was some PTSD that wasn't uh, treated properly, um, and. Uh, I don't know. He, he was he was paranoid. Uh, maybe all those operations that he did, you know, they just they were haunting him. Yeah, that's an amazing. Uh, well, wow, background that you you know so much about that. What what uh, what was his life like just before he died? Um, you know, he 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 was a proud man. Uh, he was so. a proud man. Yeah. He was he was. Um, he really kept to himself, uh, but he, he was healthy, he kept himself clean, his stuff, all his, uh, he kept all his things in a, in a storage, uh, unit, which I, I was one of the few people that, that knew about. Uh, so we went over there. Um, I, I tried to get somebody from his family to fly up and, uh, I'm sorry, fly down and, and, uh, take control of it, but, but nobody could at the time. So. Uh, I, I continue to this day to maintain that storage unit and keep his stuff in there because otherwise they were thrown away. But in, inside that storage unit was almost every breadcrumb I needed to learn everything about Richard Flaherty. Um, wow. Letters, military documents, pictures. Uh, his, his beret was in there. I mean, there was just there was just everything that was in there. Um, there is one there's one thing shocking uh, at the end with Richard, but there's a lot of shocking things. So that time period that I knew Richard, that 15 years uh, that he was homeless and it wasn't people always ask me, but are you sure he was homeless? Yeah, he, he was homeless. He lived under a tree and there was, you know, he was there 24 um, seven. The, the shock was when I went into that storage unit, uh, I found a little box with, looked like everything from a spy movie, including his passport. And it revealed in that time that he was homeless that he traveled to uh, Cambodia, Thailand, uh, Amman, Jordan, Iraq, uh, and he went to Venezuela twice. And um, nobody's really sure what he was doing, who he was working yeah. for. Uh, <laughs> you know, he was, uh, that's a, that's uh, a special group of countries, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he, went to, uh, he went to a little city in Venezuela called Puerto La Cruz. And I try to ask whatever you know federal agents that I'm still friends with, and they just said that's a very dangerous location. Right, we'd be there for a specific reason that none of these places are for a vacation. I guess besides Thailand, 
but um, Iraq certainly, uh, Jordan. Um, but uh, you know, I, I filed Freedom of Information Acts, and nobody's really given me any information on Richard. Uh, so that mystery is still open for any of your audience that wants to try to help solve it. I think we should let it rest in peace. To tell you the truth, uh, I, I think I think I think sometimes you shouldn't look for answers you don't know. So, you right, know, right. You know, you're not going why kick a sleeping dog or whatever they say. I, I, I'm I'm with you on that. Yeah, it's not 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 necessary. But he seemed like a real. I mean, obviously, he went to jump jump school, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah there's, um, you know, in the in the documentary, uh, we interview you know a bunch of the guys that were with him, and they were just shocked because the equipment, none of the equipment fit him. Uh, everything was down to his feet; it wasn't down to his knees, his rucksack. They actually uh, used to have to strap machine gun parts onto him because he didn't weigh enough to go down. So, and he would just float off. So, I think this is the first few times he jumped. He <laughs> really. Yeah, he went too far off oh the of his weight, and it took him too long to descend. So right. they ended up strapping machine gun parts on him, and they would always make him jump first, and they would see which way the wind blew him. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, that's, that, so that's the wind detector. Okay, yeah, nice, <laughs> nice <laughs> job. They yeah. throw a little rag out with a little weight on the bottom to do that, <laughs> and then they circle the drop zone. So they threw Richard out and. He was light enough. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. yeah, oh yeah. My so okay, so when he got uh, the, you said he did two tours, hey? So so his, his first uh, first tour was uh, I believe December of sixty seven to December of sixty eight. Uh, obviously, uh, one of the first things he he was uh, sent up to north to uh, the uh, demilitarized zone for the uh, Tet Offensive. Yeah, but just show me one moment. We we went over together. Yeah, I, I um I went it, over with him. We not personally knowing him, but second and third brigades left de uh, December tenth at Fort Campbell and went to Oakland, then to Wake Island, the Philippines, and then into Benoit. So yeah, we took that same trip together. I'm glad yeah. that I know I took that trip with him now. He he talked to me a little bit. You know, here's here's the the the, the, the word. You know, here's a good part that people should think about. When, when Richard told me his life story, you know, I, the first thing that came to my mind is this is the most incredible. First, I didn't believe him. I, I felt bad. I was like, here's my friend for 15 years. This is delusional. There's no such thing as four foot nine, 97 pound men in the military. I, I even know that. It's impossible. So I, I didn't believe him. And I kind of felt a little bad that, you know, my friend's that delusional. But that night, I went home and I checked on the, on the internet and I found an old newspaper article of him running with a rifle bigger than him. And I was like, this is maybe the most incredible story never to be told. So I went back to him the next day and I said, Richard, I, I can't imagine you, you overcame so much adversity in your life. You did the incredible, the impossible. You didn't just get into the military. You became a Green Beret captain and won the Silver Star. How did you go from there to on the streets and I don't know how, but I want to tell your story. I, I mean, I'm, I'm just a cop. I'm not a, you know, I, I, in the back of my mind, I honestly thought I could convince somebody who really knew what they were doing to make the film because uh, I don't have any experience with that. So, right, right. So he agreed, but he had, uh, he had uh, three conditions. Condition number one was we start the project no matter what happens. Uh, you have to finish it. Um, uh, Oh, uh, number two was if there's ever a, uh, um, a feature film, Hollywood film, Brad Pitt has to play him. And then uh, <laughs> number three was that he wants a million dollars. So <laughs> we shook on that. But but here's here's the important part. In my mind, I thought, you know, I see Richard for 15 years. I thought we had forever. I didn't know we only had 10 days was the countdown until he, he passed. So I, I think it's an important lesson that never take anything for granted that people are going to be here. Really, you know, embrace things and live for the moment, and, and really, um, you know, I, I don't want I don't want to make uh, Richard's story a, a sad or depressing story. I, I think it's a, it's a story of, of an incredible underdog. Yeah, absolutely, it, yeah. It, it's it should be looked at. That. I I'd rather talk about his life than his death. Um, the death was really strange and, and I can go as a police officer into all the bizarre things. And the, the, the person that killed him was a, also worked for another police department. Um, it, it just, it's pointless to me. I'd rather talk about his life. Yeah. 
It makes sense to me because I'll tell you what, he has more heart and gumption and, and dedication and and servitude than any, anybody I ever know, i tell you to tell you that. Especially at that short, short of frame, it's kind of like he was so dedicated, he was going to get what he wanted to do, what he wanted to do regardless, and he did it. Yeah, that, that, that was one, you know, theme. Everyone I interviewed was that Richard was driven. He was yeah. driven. And in Vietnam, they said he was tough as nails. Some people felt he was a little over-aggressive in Vietnam, but better to be over-aggressive than under-aggressive. That's for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, some people thought that he was he was tough on the enemy. He was real tough. But, you know, they, they, he. Um, I ended up uh, speaking to uh, Colonel Cushman. Uh, I, I called the. Uh, I was given a phone number at the 101st Airborne Reunion. Jack uh, Cushman. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, commander. Yeah, so so I I, yeah. I would assume that the man was that wasn't here anymore because he would be in his late 90s. And I called this phone number, and out of the blue, he answered, and he remembered his little one meter lieutenant, and he said, "Man, he really." <laughs> <laughs> he said, "Richard really took it to the enemy." So. Yeah. That's a great. That's a great contact. I yeah. uh, I have a big, small business. I knocked on the guy's door one day to do an estimate, and Jack Cushman opens the door. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he yeah. was the first first question he said to me. He goes, well, you're so sharp. When I called him, he goes, what's a cop doing making a documentary? I was like, I don't know. Yeah. Just He's a good that. guy. He, he came to a couple of our reunions at West Point, too, the 101st Airborne Bastogne reunion. That was really, really nice of him. Yeah, uh, he actually, I found in Richard's things a letter he personally wrote to Richard saying, hey, well, why aren't you coming to these reunions? We want to see you. Because I guess yeah. the just wasn't going to the there reunion. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. Anything, anything else before we wrap it up? No, I mean, I just uh, if if your your public your audience wants to see uh, where they can learn more about Richard, um, yeah. the, the book is on Amazon. Um, it's at Barnes and Noble, Walmart. It can be as a paperback, ebook, or audio book. The audio book's about eight hours, and the documentary is on Amazon Prime, uh, Google Play, Tubi, YouTube. So, uh, you know, just search, just search in Google Richard Flaherty and you'll find a, a place to. to what to about, what uh, about searching the giant killer? Uh, I'm sorry. What about the searching the giant killer? So, so what, so the, the, the original film, the first uh, version I did was the giant killer. Then I came out with, you know, after, after the book came out, more people started giving us more information and sending us pictures. So that's I, I redid the film as the Giant Killer Finding Flaherty. Uh, that that's basically a, a redo on the film with with all the new pictures and new information. Yeah. So and so the book is the same name, and so they can look at it that way, right? Yeah, the Giant Killer. Yeah. Great. Good for you, man. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. The run that and, happened uh, over the weekend. The victim, a decorated job. veteran, Thanks, decorated sir. Vietnam veteran, killed after a hit and run. A 70-year-old decorated Vietnam veteran. Personal items and debris scattered across the street where a Vietnam veteran was hit by a car. The driver never stopped to help. Salute. To you, my friend. Thank you. Okay, brother. Take care. You too. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. We all set, brother? That was great, man. Thank you so much. Hey, man. You know, um, I really wanted to...
thank the, the, the guys that, that worked on the documentary that passed right after we finished. It was Captain Rick Lencioni from okay. the Hunter. I know Rick. Yeah, Rick was an amazing friend. Okay, um, wait a minute. We can still do that. We can we get Matt together. Hey, Matt. Hey, Matt. Hey, he's, he's running around Costa Rica. <laughs> Let me tell you, I love that.